So far, in the tale of the children of Hurin, we've seen so much hardship and suffering and violence and tragedy. But there's one thing we've not yet seen, something almost unthinkable, unimaginable considering what's come before, yet in this video we will see it. Genuine joy, love, peace, contentment. For the first time in a very long while, Turin has happy days. He finds friendship and romance, and he'll suddenly find that for the first time in his adult life, he has so much to lose. Maya, Govan, and Melanine, and welcome to another installment in this series explaining and breaking down Tolkien's epic first age tale of the children of Hurin. And in this video, Turin Turambar's going to try to master his doom, to escape his curse, and to rise above his cruel fate. But just before we crack on with Turin's tale, I first want to explore who it is that he's now dwelling with. The Woodsman of Brethiel, the last remnant of the House of Haleth, and one of the last groups of free men left in Beleriand. Now, the chieftain of these woodland dwelling men is a guy called Brandir often remembered as Brandir the Lame, due to some misadventure that broke his leg in his childhood, never healed, and has now left him limping for the rest of his life. And honestly, Brandir is a pretty interesting guy. I think the first thing to say about him is that he's really quite different from most of the other warrior men that we've met in the story so far. Brandir is not a fighter. First and foremost, he is a healer. He's a man of gentle mood who is said to love wood rather than metal and the knowledge of things that grow in the earth rather than other lore. The second thing to say about Brandir is that he's a relatively young chieftain, a year younger than Turin, only 31 when we meet him. And by this final century of the First Age, Brandir is now the chieftain of a humble house. The House of Haleth has been dwindled by war into a small, isolated people, and the few that remain now live in hiding within a defensive stockade upon a hill called Armon Obel, right in the heart of the Forest of Brethiel. And just as the elven king Ordreth also once believed, Brandir is of the firm opinion that the only way to keep his people safe is to keep them secret, behind the walls of his wooden fortress, a defensible settlement atop the hill that bears his name, Ethel Brandir. And the third thing that needs to be said about Brandir is that although he and Turin have never met before, they are actually very closely related. I've already gone into a fair bit of detail on this, but basically Brandir's grandfather was married to the sister of Turin's grandfather, and Turin's grandmother was married to the brother of Brandir's grandmother which means their fathers, Hurin and Handir, are double first cousins. They share all four of the same grandparents. And thus, Brandir and Turin are each other's double second cousins. Turin is, of course, most often associated with the House of Hador. Hurin was the chieftain of the House of Hador, Dorlomin used to belong to the House of Hador, but there's a lot more to Turin's family tree than just that. Through his mother Morwen, Turin is also descended from the chieftains of the House of Beor. And as I've just mentioned, Hurin shares just as much heritage with the chieftains of the House of Haleth from his mother's side as he does with the chieftains of the House of Hador on his father's side. 
Which means, after Brandir, who has no wife and no children, and thus no heir, Turin Turambar is the guy with the strongest claim to rule the Woodsman of Brethiel as the Lord of the House of Haleth. Pretty much the last remnant of free men left in these dark days of Morgoth's dominion. Now, of course, Turin also has no wife and no child and thus no heir right now, but in this video, that is going to change. However, I am getting ahead of myself. At the end of the last video, a woodman called Dorlas and his woodland hunters made the fateful decision to not let Turin die of an all-consuming grief upon the grave of Princess Finduilas, Hauth and Eleth, and instead they brought him back to Ethel Brandir to their secret home to be healed by their chieftain. And when Brandir is presented with the body of his second cousin, he immediately recognizes him. Not as Turin, son of Hurin, his second cousin, and not as the Mormegil, whom Dorlas tells him is a mighty orc slayer that might be of help to us if he should live. Instead, when Brandir first looks upon the unconscious body of Turin, a dark shadow fell on his heart, and he said, O oh, cruel men of Haleth, with great labour you have brought hither the last bane of our people. But Dorlas and the other woodsmen strongly disagree with their chieftain. They believe the Mormegil will be a profoundly useful asset in Brethiel, a warrior who will bring them out of secretive isolation and make the House of Haleth mighty once more. Still, the shadow persists in Brandir's heart, but he does agree that healing a desperate man is better than leaving him to die woe-stricken and pecked at by carrion. So Brandir does what Brandir does best. He takes Turin into his house, he tends him, and in the end, heals him. After a long fell winter, Spring at last comes again, and Turin finally wakes. He shakes off his darkness, and as I explained at the end of the last video, he declared in his heart, a new day has come. Here I shall stay in peace, and renounce name and kin, and so I shall put my shadow behind me. Turin, son of Hurin, rebrands himself. He recasts himself and is reborn as Turambar of Brethiel, the master of his doom. Before long, Turambar is well loved by almost all the woodsmen, and he is soon counted as one born amongst the people of Brethiel. Both Brandir and Dorlas know the truth. Turambar was once the Mormegil of Nargothrond, and according to rumor, the Mormegil of Nargothrond was once Turin, son of Hurin. In private, Turambar admits that he's heard those rumours too, but he begs his new friend Dorlas to tell no one. Let his true name remain hidden. Dorlas readily agrees to this. He has great love for Turambar, the secret Mormegil, but Brandir is a little more troubled. He recognizes that with a change of name does not necessarily come a change of temper, 
And although Turambar has laid down his black sword and forsworn ever carrying it into battle again, he has taken up in its place other weapons. He cannot wholly forget his old griefs against the servants of Morgoth, and although he will no longer lead armies to reclaim the wild, he cannot give up the fight entirely. Despite his best intentions to become a man of peace, a master of his violent fate, it is simply unconscionable for him to suffer any orc, to draw anywhere near the place where Finduilas lies, the grave of the elf maid, not after what they did to the princess of Nargothrond, who loved him so dearly. And so, as months pass and spring turns to summer, the orcs of the wild learn to fear the grave of Finduilas. The woodsmen come to love the newcomer Turambar, and Brandir grows concerned that the silence and secrecy of Brethiel may now be threatened by this son of Hurin, and his surely not put away forever black sword. Until the day comes when everything changes. So, one day, Trambar catches wind that a company of orcs are trying to use the crossings of Tyglean in order to reach some orc hold they have somewhere on the other side. But the crossings of Tyglean lie far too close to the grave of Finduilas, so Trambar and a company of woodland hunters go out and they kill everyone of the orcs. Unsurprisingly, Turambar is just as talented at killing the enemy as Turin was, and so after a very swift hunt, all the servants of Morgoth are dead. But it would seem that the reason why these orcs were out and about when they were is because at this moment, the sun is hidden behind black clouds. A great storm is rolling in, and whilst the woodsmen are wiping out their enemy, this storm suddenly breaks. As the victorious woodsmen journey home back towards the hill of Amonobel, terrific claps of thunder boom overhead, rain falls in great torrents, and lightning flashes like white fire in the sky. And as Turambar draws near Howl the Eleth, the grave of Finduilas, a great flash of it illuminates the shape of the mound. And in that moment, Turambar sees something unexplainable. He stops, he covers his eyes, and he trembles. Because, lying on top of the mound, there is what appears to be the wraith of a slain woman, golden haired just like Finduilas, lying seemingly dead in the exact same spot where the princess was buried. Eventually, Turambar masters his shock, and he goes towards it, finding that his eyes do not deceive him. Right there, in the place where Finduilas died, there lies a woman, naked, drenched by the rain, and quivering. When Turambar comes to her, she closes her eyes and trembles no more. He casts his cloak about her and bears her away with the rest of his woodsmen towards a nearby hunter's lodge within the forest. There, a fire is lit and warm bedspreads are wrapped around the cold and desperate lady. Eventually, her eyes open again, and she looks upon the woodsman. Her gaze falls upon Turambar, and a light comes into her face. 
she puts out a hand towards him as if she had found at last something that she had sought in the darkness, and she was comforted. Turambar takes that hand, and he smiles, and he asks her what her name is and what evil has befallen her. But the lady says nothing. She simply shakes her head and begins to weep. So the woodsmen let her be. They give her all the food they can spare and she eats it hungrily. When she's finished, she reaches for Turambar's hand once again and Turambar says to her, With us you are safe. Here may you rest this night and in the morning we will lead you to our homes up in the high forest. But then he asks her again, what is your name? Who are your kin? And once again, the lady gives no answer. All she does is weep. So Turambar decides that her tale must be too sad yet to tell, and he asks her no more. But he does give her a name by which he and the rest of the woodsmen might call her until she is able to reveal her own. And so, Turambar calls this lady the Tear Maiden, or Maiden of Tears, which is in the Sindarin language, Niniel. And when the weeping lady hears that name, she looks up. She looks at Turambar and she says her first word to him. Ninia, the name by which she will forever afterwards be known to the people of Brethiel. In the morning, Turambar and his woodsmen bear Niniel into the forest and towards the hill of Amon Obel. They follow Dimrost, the rainy stair, up the tumbling stream of Celebros towards a wooden bridge over foaming steps. And there, the air is filled with spray, like rain, and on a summer's day, it's a cool and refreshing place. But when Niniel climbs those steps, she suddenly turns cold. So cold that although it's still high summer, she cannot be warmed or comforted. She begins to shiver. And then she starts shivering so much that this place forever afterwards becomes known as Nengirith, the shuddering water. Turambar hastens them all away, but by the time they make it to Amon Obel, Niniel is wandering in fever. She's lain to rest within Ethelbrandir, and the wives of the woodsmen tend to her night and day. Yet long she lies in sickness, even though Brandir uses all his skill in her healing. Most of the time she lies restlessly, moaning in her sleep, and yet throughout all her long fever, she never mutters any word in any language of elves or men. And throughout all her long fever, everyone watching over Niniel notices the same thing. The only times she will lie at peace and sleep restfully is whenever Turambar is near. So he sits often with her, wondering who she is and how she ended up upon the grave of Finduilas. He says to himself, How then, Eleth, from the green mound she came, is that a sign, and how shall I read it? Eventually, after lying long with Turambar beside her, Niniel's health slowly returns. In time, she wakes and begins to eat, but still, something isn't quite right. Niniel can't speak. Well, I mean, she can speak. She's already spoken the word Niniel. I suppose what I should say is she has no words with which to speak. 
as if she were a child. The people of Brethiel have to teach her language word by word. But she is a swift learner, and she takes great delight in learning new words as if they were treasures she'd once mislaid and was now finding again. When she's learned enough to speak with friends, she asks them to teach her more words, always wanting to know the names of the many things around her. But what Ninia loves most is learning the names of all the living things. And in those matters, it is Brandir who knows the most. And so, often, Niniel goes to Brandir's house and they talk together whilst walking the gardens and glades of Brethiel. In time, Brandir begins to fall in love with the mysterious Tear Maiden, and when she grows strong, she lends him her arm so that they can walk together further and more easily. And Niniel does love Brandir too, but she loves him as a brother. Instead, it is to Turambar that Niniel gives her heart, and it's only when he is near that she will smile. Only Turambar can make the Tear Maiden laugh. It's not every day that we can talk about Turin Trambar making people laugh, unless it's Morgoth or Glaurung, but right now he's inspiring happiness and love. And as Niniel falls in love with him, so too does he fall in love with Niniel. One evening, in the golden autumn, they sit together and they watch the sun set the hillside and the houses of Ethel Brandir aglow. There is a deep quiet between them, but suddenly Niniel turns to Turambar and she says to him, Of all things I have now asked the name, save you, what are you called? To which Turin answers, Turambar. Niniel pauses, as if listening for some echo, but then she asks, what does Turambar mean? Turin tells her it means Master of the Dark Shadow. For I also, Niniel, had my darkness, in which dear things were lost, but now I have overcome it. And did you also flee from it, running, until you came to these fair woods? Niniel asks. And when did you escape? Yes, I fled for many years, and I escaped when you did so. For it was dark when you came, Niniel, but ever since it has been light. And it seems that what I long sought in vain has come to me. As the golden year wanes and passes into a gentle winter, there comes another bright year, and there is peace in Brethiel, and joy in Turin's life, and Turambar and Niniel decide that together they will overcome their respective shadows. Now, given how deeply tragic the vast majority of the story has been so far, I'll understand if you are a little tense right now, waiting for something to go horribly wrong and bring an immediate end to everyone's happy days. But. I am delighted to tell you that's not going to happen this time. For once, we actually get to be happy. You can relax, the orcs are disappearing into the south at this time, and life in the forest of Brethiel is really, really good. 
Niniel is fully healed, she grows fair and strong, and when the gentle winter turns into a kindly spring, Turambar can restrain himself no longer. He asks his beloved Niniel if he may be hers in marriage. And when he does, the Maiden of Tears is joyful indeed. But there is one person in Brethiel who isn't quite so happy about all of this. When Brandir finds out that the son of Hurin has asked for Niniel's hand in marriage, his heart was sick within him. Partly, I think, because he is in love with Niniel, but also partly out of fear of the rumours surrounding the cursed son of Hurin, Brandir wonders what misfortunes might this man bring upon his people, and upon his home, and upon the woman that he loves. So Brandir speaks to Niniel, and he tells her, be not in haste, think me not unkindly, if I counsel you to wait. Niniel replies, Nothing that you do is done unkindly, but why then do you give me such counsel, wise brother? To which Brandir tells her, There lies a shadow on this man, and I am afraid. There was a shadow, says Niniel, for so he told me but he has escaped from it, even as I. And is he not worthy of love? Though he now holds himself at peace, was he not once the greatest captain, from whom all our enemies would flee? Who told you that? asks Brandir, and Niniel tells him it was Dorlas. Does he not speak the truth? Now, Brandir is ill-pleased to hear this, for Dorlas is the leader of those woodsmen that wish most to abandon secrecy, and to instead wage war upon the orcs, an idea that concerns Brandir immensely, and so he seeks to delay Niniel's entangling herself among the most troublesome of the woodsmen, and especially entangling herself in marriage to the cursed son of Hurin. So, he says to her, Turambar was the captain of Nargothrond, and came before out of the north, and was, it is said, son of Hurin of Dorlomin, of the warlike House of Hador. Indeed, Niniel, well may you think that such a one is likely ere long to go back to war, far from this land maybe. And if so, how long will you endure it? Have a care, for I forebode that if Turambar goes again to battle, then not he but the Shadow shall have the mastery. Now, this warning does not in any way change Niniel's feelings for her beloved, but Brandir's words do trouble her, and so she bids Turambar to wait just a little while. Understandably, I think, Turin is a little downcast to be rejected, and he was not at all pleased to find out that it was Brandir who counselled her to wait, but Turambar respects her decision. He doesn't do anything crazy, he doesn't go after Brandir, he simply waits for the woman he loves. A full year later, after four more seasons of building their love for each other, Turambar once again asks Niniel to marry him. He says, We have waited, and now I will wait no longer. Do as your heart bids you, Niniel, most dear. But see, this is the choice before me. I will go back now to war in the wild, or I will wed you, and never go to war again, save only to defend you 
if some evil assails our home. And to this, Niniel is glad indeed. She says, yes, she will wed Turambar, and together they will live in peace forever. They plight their troth, and at midsummer they are married. Interestingly, same day that Aragorn and Arwen will get married on in about six and a half thousand years' time. On that day of Turambar and Niniel's wedding, the woodsmen make them a great feast, and then all the people of Brethiel worked together to build them a fair house upon Omonobel for them to dwell in, and eventually for them to raise a family in. And in that house, Turambar and Niniel dwelt in happiness. The forest of Brethiel was at peace, the house of Haleth was content, and the master of fate and his tear maiden lived together in joy in their marital home. Let's take a moment to savour this. We have had a gentle winter, a kind spring, a glorious summer, that eventually wanes into another golden autumn. Such a happy ending for our story. At least it would be if this were the ending. But you may be wondering, or you may be able to guess, what was it? that drew all those many, many orc warbands away from the north. They weren't driven south by their enemies, instead they were called there, summoned there, by the malice that dwells in those southerly lands, the Dragon King of Nargothron. By the end of Trambar's third year amongst the woodsmen, the power and malice of King Glaurung the Golden had waxed fat. He gathered an army to what remains of Nargothrond, he readies them for war, and he turns an eye towards the very last remnant of free men to defy the power of the north. For it was the purpose of Morgoth to subdue all Beleriand and to search out its every corner so that none in any hall or hiding might live that were not thrall to him. Thus, whether Glaurung guessed where Turin was hidden or whether, as some hold, he had indeed for that time escaped, from the eye of evil that pursued him is of little matter. Either way, the dragon has stirred, the orcs are on their way, and the peace of the forest of Brethiel is about to be broken. Which puts our hero in a very difficult position. At the last two choices only, could there be for Turambar to sit deedless until he was found, driven forth like a rat, or to go forth soon to battle and be revealed? But Turambar is not the same man he was a decade ago. He's older now, wiser, and he's made a promise to his wife, to Niniel, a promise that he will not break at the first sign of trouble. And, in the exact words of Niniel, our homes are not yet assailed, as your word was. It is said that the orcs are not many, and Dorlas has told me that before you came, such a phrase were not seldom, and the woodmen held them off. So, for a while, Turambar remains at peace. Gorthang remains sheathed, and hidden, and Turambar's fate remains, it would appear, mastered for a while. But these orcs are not like the other orcs that we've encountered so far. 
We are told that they were of a fell breed, fierce and cunning, and they came with a purpose to invade the forest of Brethiel. This isn't a small warband passing through the eaves of the forest, they're not opportunistic hunters, they're an army, bred and trained and armed for war. When they near the crossings of Tyagaline, it is Dorlas who leads a force of woodsmen to meet them, but against an army like this, the men of Brethiel have never been tested. Many of Dorlas's hunters are slain, and the rest are driven back in defeat. The orcs cross the river, and they swarm inside the forest. When Dorlas returns to Amon Obel, he shows Turambar his wounds, and he tells him of the great losses they've suffered. He says, See, Lord, now is the time of our need come upon us. Did you not ask to be counted one of our people? Is this peril not yours also? For our homes will not remain hidden if the orcs come further into our land. Which just makes things so impossibly difficult for Turambar. Every time he gets involved and tries to make things right, things get so much worse. He knows this. Yet apparently when he doesn't get involved and tries to make peace, things still get so much worse. Once again, there can be no winning for our hero. But Dorlas does make a good point. Turambar asked to be counted amongst the woodsmen as one born in Brethiel. This is his home, and there is no one who can defend it quite so fiercely as he. And so, for the first time in three years, Turambar takes up again his black blade Gorthong, and he wields it once more in battle. And so epic is the gallantry of Turambar that all the woodsmen take inspiration from him, they gather to his side with new courage rising in their hearts, until Turambar has an army of many hundreds under his command. Now, an army of many hundreds does sound like an awful lot, considering the House of Haleth is a really small house at this point, but there is very fertile ground for speculation here, because the House of Haleth is unique among the houses of the Edine in that many centuries ago they set a precedent of having women warriors. So although Tolkien doesn't state it, we can imagine that maybe a number of these warriors that follow Turambar might have been women. Anyway, regardless, they set out into the woods, slaying every orc that slinks among the trees. Then the woodmen hang these orc corpses from the branches of their trees, so that when a much larger branch of this orc army approaches the crossings of Tyagaline, they swiftly learn that they have three things to be utterly afraid of. The bodies of their dead swinging from the trees they are hoping to conquer, a host of woodsmen far larger than any orc was expecting, and the terror of the Black Sword returned. Of the orc army that came to Brethiel, very few ever returned to Nargothrond. After the overwhelming majority were slain, the woodmen built great pyres, and the soldiers of Morgoth were burned in heaps upon them, so that the smoke of Brethiel's vengeance rose black into heaven. Eventually, Turambar led his warriors back to Amon Obel, and Niniel rejoiced at the sight of him. 
The winter passed on without any more great hardship, and once again, Brethiel had peace. You see, far away in the south, Glaurung was wrathful indeed that his sure thing had been so decisively overcome. But right now, there's not much he can do. He doesn't have an army anymore. He put all his eggs into one basket, and Turambar set fire to that basket. So Glaurung ponders, and he listens, and he waits for the moment when he himself might come forth to deal with the woodman himself. But whilst Glaurung lays his sinister plans in Nargothrond, back up in Brethiel, Turambar is also pondering the dragon. The die is cast, he reflects to himself. Now comes the test. I will flee no more, Turambar indeed I will be. By my own will and prowess I will surmount my doom, or fall. But falling or riding, Glaurung at least, I will slay. Throughout the winter of peace, Turambar sends scouts far afield, not to fight, just to know what the enemy's getting up to. Now, you may very well be thinking, Turambar is not the chieftain of the House of Haleth. Should it not be Brandir making these decisions, especially in a time of war? Well, turns out Turambar has now found himself in a very familiar position. Though no word was said, he now ordered things as he would, as if he were the lord of Brethiel, and no man heeded Brandir. Now, firstly, you probably don't need me to tell you that if we replace the word Brethiel with Nargothrond, and Brandir with Ordreth, then we've basically already read that exact sentence earlier in the story, and it didn't turn out well the last time. But I do want to point out, this is not a story about Turambar usurping Brandir's authority. He isn't trying to overthrow his second cousin or get back at him for what he said to Niniel about Turin's true identity. It's just an unfortunate situation involving two characters who, on the one hand, are very different from each other, but on the other hand, have just a little bit too much in common. Brandir is a gentle man of healing and wisdom. He has a specific talent when it comes to knowledge of woodcraft, but also a specific disability when it comes to military matters of fighting. During their days of peace through secrecy, Brandir was an excellent chieftain, but he is not a man of war and Turambar decidedly is. Furthermore, Brandir's authority as Lord of the House of Haleth comes from his lordly ancestors, as you'd expect, and among them, his grandfather, the great chieftain who fought and died defending the High King of the Noldor during the Nir Nyeth Arnoidiad. But Turin is the grandson of that chieftain's sister. He and Brandir have the same great-grandfather, and Turin is also descended from the chieftains of Hador and Beor's houses. During peacetime, his claim to authority over the men of Brethiel isn't that far off Brandir's claim, especially considering that among the House of Haleth, women can inherit power. Haleth herself was a woman chieftain. And in the days of war, when dragons and orcs descend upon their home, the loyalties of the woodmen begin to turn towards the warrior and away from the healer. Nonetheless, throughout the winter of peace, all remains quiet, and when a hopeful spring follows, the men of the wood are joyful and they are singing at their work. 
And it would appear there's more good news. In that spring, during their first year of marriage, Niniel discovers she is with child, pregnant with Turin's son or daughter. However, as joyous as this news is for the woodsman and for Turambar, Niniel becomes pale, weaker, her energy fades and her happiness is dimmed. And shortly after learning that he's soon to be a father, Turambar hears another piece of news far more troubling. His scouts return from beyond Tyaglin, and they report that they have seen great burning far out upon the plain before Nargothrond. Before long, there come more reports, fires drawing ever northward, and then the worst news of all, Glaurung is abroad. He has left Nargothrond, and he is coming with hatred and vengeance and dragon fire. But there are some amongst the woodsmen whom Tolkien calls the more foolish or more hopeful, who begin to believe that this might be a good thing. I mean, Glaurung's army is destroyed. He's leaving the safety of Nargothrond. Perhaps he's simply returning to Angband in fear and in shame, and he'll pass Brethil by. But Turambar is not among them. Turambar knows the truth. Glaurung is coming for him. Day after day after day, Turambar keeps his promise to Niniel, living in peace with her, but knowing it's only a matter of time before Gurthang must be unsheathed once more. His happy days are drawing to a close, and all too soon, the hopeful spring turns into a summer of dread. One day, a pair of scouts return to Turambar in terror. They tell him they have seen the great worm Glaurung with their own eyes, and he draws now near to Tyglin and turns not aside. He lies in the midst of a great burning, and the trees smoke about him, and the evil stench of him can scarce be endured. And, running in a straight line for all the leagues between Nargothrond and where the dragon is now, there can be seen a great road of withered desolation that does not swerve and points directly at the heart of Brethiel. However, despite the terror of these scouts and the hopelessness of Brethiel's current plight, Turambar is not scared. He's got a plan. And I understand that in light of the 11 or so hours of story that have preceded this moment, the words Turin's got a plan might put you a little bit on edge, but I have to say, this time, Turambar's plan is actually quite a clever one. He recognises that Glaurung's straight line of desolation is actually, potentially, advantageous to the woodman. The river Tyaglin still lies between the dragon and the forest, and if Glaurung were following the north-south road, he would doubtless cross at the crossings of Tyaglin, a place where he would have a massive advantage in open battle. However, the dragon's not swerving. If he keeps going straight, he'll have to cross the river not at the crossings of Tyaglin, but at the ravines. A little downstream from the crossings, the Tyaglin gathers power from other streams, and its waters cleave through the feet of the highlands that lie just to the south of Brethiel. And thus, here, the river flows in great force at the bottom of these deep ravines, whose great sides are like walls of rock. 
and it's right across that ravine that Glaurung's straight line of devastation is going to force him to cross. In that moment, he will be vulnerable. At that place, Turambar will kill the dragon. That's the plan he shares with the woodsman. But first, he gathers the men of Brethiel in council at Ethel Brandir, and he delivers to them a pretty epic speech. And this speech is really cool because it demonstrates just how far our hero has come since his days as an outlaw in the wild. It shows just how much he's grown and the extent to which his pride and his hubris have been tempered by wisdom and compassion for his people. He begins by saying something that many of the woodsmen find disappointing. Men of Brethiel, a deadly peril has come upon us, which only great hardihood shall turn aside. But in this matter, numbers will avail little. We must use cunning and hope for good fortune. If we went up against this dragon with all our strength as against an army of orcs, we should but offer ourselves all to death, and so leave our wives and kin defenseless. Therefore I say that you should stay here and prepare for flight, for if Glaurung comes, then you must abandon this place and scatter far and wide, and so may some escape and live. But. I do not believe that this dragon is unconquerable. Turambar tells the woodsman a story. A story he heard as a child in the year following the great battle of unnumbered tears. In that, near Nyeth Arnoidiad, Glaurung came forth in his full might and he withered the elves and men that stood against him in East Beleriand. But, despite his strength and his malice, that disastrous battle still didn't end well for Glaurung. The dwarves withstood him, and their lord, Azagal of Belagost, died, wounding the dragon with a knife into the Great Worm's belly. Azagal had only a dagger in his hand, yet the prick of it was enough to send Glaurung fleeing back into Angband. Then, Trambar sweeps Gurthang from its sheath, and he declares, here is a thorn, sharper and longer than the knife of Azagal and the woodsmen give out a great cry. The Black Thorn of Brethiel. They call him the Black Thorn of Brethiel. Turambar replies, Well may he fear it, for know this, it is the doom of this dragon and all his brood, it is said, that how great soever be his armor of horn harder than iron, Below he must go with the belly of a snake. Therefore I say to you, men of Brethiel, I go now to find the belly of Glaurung. He needs only a few strong men to come with him, strong in arms but stronger still in heart. Of all the men in Brethiel, at first only one steps forward. Dorlas. The rest are afraid. The dread of Glaurung lies upon them, and the tales of the scouts have only grown in terror with each telling. But it's as Dorlas steps forward, and then realises that no one else is going to do the same, that we begin to see that unspoken ambiguity concerning whether it is Turambar the warrior or Brandir the healer, who truly rules in Brethiel, turn from tension into open conflict. 
Dorlas blames his chieftain Brandir for the perceived cowardice of his fellow woodsmen. He addresses all the men in the council, including Brandir himself, saying, Hearken, men of Brethiel, it is now well seen that for the evil of our times, the counsels of Brandir were in vain. There is no escape by hiding. Will none of you take the place of the son of Handir, that the house of Haleth be not put to shame? For a moment, no one speaks. This would be Turambar's opportunity to challenge his second cousin and to formally take over as the chieftain of Brethiel. But he doesn't. He says nothing. Brandir also says nothing, but in his heart he is bitter towards Turambar. It was Dorlas who insulted him, but Turambar whom Brandir blames. However, eventually another man rises from the rest, and he stands against Dorlas and says, You do evilly to speak thus to the shame of your lord, whose limbs by ill hazard cannot do as his heart would. Beware lest the contrary be seen in you at some turn. And how can it be said that his counsels were vain when they were never taken? I say to you that Glaurung comes now to us as to Nargothrond before, because our deeds have betrayed us, as he feared. Now, the guy who said that, his name is Hunthor, and Hunthor is a kinsman of Brandir's, and he's a character that I really quite like. In the Children of Hurin, it's never explained exactly how Hunthor is related to Brandir, but in an unfinished sort of sequel to the Children of Hurin, Tolkien explains it in full, and turns out it's pretty cool. Remember Brandir's grandfather, Haldir, and Turin's grandmother, Hareth, sister of Haldir? Well, as it goes, Hareth and Haldir also had two other siblings. One was a brother called Hundar, who ended up having a grandson called Hardang, that's completely irrelevant to this story, but he will be very important in that unfinished sequel story that I'll get to. And they also had a sister called Heriel, who ended up having two grandsons, one of whom will also be very important in that Children of Hurin sequel story, and the other brother is this Hunthor. Which means Hunthor and his brother are Brandir's second cousins and also Turin's second cousins. They all share two of the same great-grandparents. Anyway, we'll see a lot more of Hunthor in the next video, but what's important right now is that after defending his second cousin Brandir, Hunthor then asks his leave to join their other second cousin Turambar on his quest to slay a dragon. Turambar readily accepts, and he declares that three is enough. He will go with Dorlas and Hunthor to bring an end to the reign of Glaurung. But before leaving this council, Turambar makes a specific point of turning to Brandir and addressing him with fair-spoken words. He says, Lord, I do not scorn you. We must go in great haste, and our task will need strong limbs. I deem that your place is with your people, for you are wise, and are a healer, and it may be that there will be great need of wisdom and healing ere long. However, although you might expect Turambar's words to kind of mend some of the conflict between him and Brandir, it doesn't. His words, though fair spoken, only embitter Brandir all the more. And he says to Hunthor, Go then, but not with my leave, for a shadow lies on this man, and it will lead you to evil. Now, 
If you've never read The Children of Hurin, but you have read The Silmarillion and its chapter about Turin Turambar, then this might come as a bit of a surprise. The Silmarillion chapter tells basically the same story as The Children of Hurin, but massively condensed. Instead of spending a few chapters with Brandir like we do in The Children of Hurin, we only spend a few paragraphs with him in The Silmarillion. And in those paragraphs, he comes across, I think, pretty positively. Certainly not in any way a malicious character. But in this Children of Hurin version, there's just so much more to him. I definitely don't think he's a bad guy in this version, but he's a lot more nuanced and a lot more flawed. Anyway, time is of the essence. Glaurong is on his way, and so Trumbar only has one last thing to do before departing with his two companions. He must bid farewell to his beloved Niniel. She clings to him, weeping grievously, and begging him, pleading, do not go forth. Challenge not the shadow that you have fled from. Nay, nay, flee still, and take me with you far away. But Turambar tells her, Niniel, most dear, we cannot flee further, you and I. We are hemmed in this land. And even should I go, deserting the people that befriended us, I could but take you forth into the houseless wild, to your death and the death of our child. But take heart, Niniel, for I say to you, neither you nor I shall be slain by this dragon. And with those words, Niniel's tears cease. She falls silent again, but her kiss is cold as they part. However, Turambar sets out anyway, with Dorlas and Hunthor and Gurthang, towards the ravines of Tyaglin, towards his rematch with the dragon, his final showdown with Glaurung. And so, in the next video, the son of Hurin and the agent of Morgoth's curse will meet again. They will clash again, and they will finish what they started four years ago at Nargothrond. And we will see whether or not Turambar turns out to be right when he told Niniel that neither of them would be slain by the dragon. So, to make sure you don't miss that, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to click like and leave a comment on this video if you want to. However, until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Navire Melanine.